So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, in the name of Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, German Research Foundation, for which I am head of press and public relations, and uh, if I may, also in the name of Brazilian National Council of Technological and Scientific Development, CNPK, jointly hosting this event, I would like to welcome you all to this press conference, which will be held in English, and which is uh, hopefully also accessible by live streaming in the internet. So welcome to everybody here at Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Outside. As you may have seen just uh, five minutes ago, the second annual meeting of Global Research Council has ended, being the largest meeting of its kind so far, and focusing on two major topics that were open access to scientific publications and scientific integrity. So directly afterwards, we would like to inform you about the meeting itself and the endorsed documents concerning the major topics. And for that, for me, it is a pleasure and also an honor to introduce to you, to the left beside me, Professor Peter Strohschneider, who is president of the German Research Foundation and co-host of this meeting. He will start with some remarks on the GSC and the meeting in general, and then will introduce the endorsed action plan towards open access. Next to him, Professor Glaucius Oliva, president of Brazilian CNPK, the other co-host, who will besides some general remarks, focus on the endorsed principles on scientific integrity. Left to him, you find Dr. Super Suresh, who was director of National Science Foundation of the U.S. till spring, and, uh, if I may say so, one of the founding fathers of uh, GSC, together with former DFG president, Professor Matthias Kleiner. Dr. Suresh, you have been the host of the first GSC meeting last year in Washington, and we would be glad if you could make some remarks on GSC's progress in these two years. And last not least, there will be an outlook and some sort of invitation to GSC's next year's meeting, which will take place in Beijing, China. And therefore, the coming two hosts will close with a few words. That's Professor Bai Chun Li, President of Chinese Academy of Science, and Dr. Isabel Blaine, Vice President of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. So following the statements, we will have some time for questions, beginning, of course, with questions from inside this room, but continuing with questions that uh, can be put also by mail from outside. So if you are following the briefing by live stream, please put your question using the email address that is shown beneath the streaming window. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to our press release and the full text of the two endorsed documents. Those who are here, you will find them in the map in front of you. And for all others from this moment on, they are also available in the Internet, together with a group photo taken this morning and some uh, impression from these three days meeting here at Berlin. So far, and I now give the word to GFG's president, Professor Stroschneider. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Um, good afternoon. It's um, five past 12. Um, not five minutes to 12. Um, um, yeah, it has been an honor and a pleasure um, and a delight um, um, to the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft to welcome the world of research and research funding um, to Berlin um, this year, and it has been an equal great pleasure to co-host um, this meeting together with my colleague and friend, Glorious Oliva, from um, Brazil. Our intention was to bring um, the international research community um, together, and we achieved that. With about 70 hats from leading science and research councils, councils from around the world, as well and as high-ranking guests from science and research, science administration, and research um, politics. And this meeting, um, comprising of um, 70 hats, is representing some 80% of the world's public non-ministerial research potential, so there is actually a great um, research politics uh, potential with the um, GRC. With the GRC, which is a voluntary informal organization of heads of research councils from around um, the world, and it pledged to find mutually acceptable paths to greater international research collaboration, and being established in 2012, the GRC is an initiative that is very 
closely related to organizations like the National Science Foundation of the US and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. We are interested in pursuing a constant exchange with other research organizations regarding questions of academic development and funding activities. Overall, one aim is to reach a global understanding on the standards and guiding principles of research funding as well as its independence from political or economical or so forth influence. Um, and um, as DFG, we have certainly been keen to use this opportunity as well as others um, to use this opportunity to draw our colleagues' attention to the high standards of the DFG evaluation and decision-making process in research funding and the model, so to say, of research funding which is based with the DFG, which is based solely on criteria of scientific quality and free from political, economic or other reasoning. By agreeing on guiding principles for research funding, we are convinced that the GRC could help developing standards that not only foster multilateral cooperation, but also enhance the quality of global science and research and scholarly endeavor itself. And that is the point. Internationalization, international cooperation is not a goal in itself, but a means of approaching highest quality in research. To ensure a wider, namely a global consultative process, the GRC's annual meeting is prepared by a set of regional meetings across the world on all five continents between October and December to gather input from funding agencies and interested stakeholders in Africa, the Americas, the Asian Pacific region, Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa. For the Berlin meeting, these conferences proved to be a great success. They did not only contribute to the development of the two documents um, just uh, announced, two documents that were up for endorsement on this conference, but also helped to build networks of trust between regional organizations and across the international science community. The first of these documents just mentioned is a statement of principles, a statement of principles for research integrity, and Glossia Saliva will tell you more about it in a moment. The second uh, of these statements is one on the subject of open access to publications, and it's my pleasure to just make some remarks on this um, second plan, the action plan towards open access. Research has often been said, research is an international endeavor, and the Internet brought about opportunities to even intensify scholarly corporations. Sharing research publications openly is a means to increase the quality of the research communication and thus of research itself. Open access has the potential to not only increase effectivity of research, it can also foster interdisciplinary research and enable new or more intense cooperation across nations. Furthermore, considering that there is an increasing demand for research information outside of universities and research institutes, be it in politics and decision-making, be it in patient care, or be it in entrepreneurship and industry, by encouraging and supporting researchers to share their publications openly over the Internet, we as research funding and research performing organizations ensure a very good return of public investment in research. Open access has long been the subject of sometimes heated debate in different countries, in many countries, in Germany as well, different and heated debate amongst many research funders and in many academic communities. However, at this annual meeting of the GRC, it was indeed for the first time that the heads of research councils from all over the world did not only discuss the topic, as it were, but agreed on a common understanding of some basic principles of open access and also agreed on an action plan to move the issue 
forward. This agreement is not only remarkable in the light of many complex issues involved in open access, and these complex issues are not only technical, these also economical, legal, organizational, epistemological issues. It is also remarkable in the light of the heterogeneity and diversity of the preconditions for open access in the various, in the various world regions. And the five um, regional conferences I, I, I was talking about, um, the five regional conferences which led to this meeting, they produced clear evidence of this diversity. We realized that only a very broad approach would help to further implement open access on a global, a global scale. A global action plan towards open access requires a good degree of flexibility, and we are confident that we manage to ensure the necessary openness that secures the engagement of all participants of this GRC meeting. This action plan towards open access specifies three basic principles for transitioning towards open access, namely encouragement, awareness raising, and support for researchers that wish to provide their results in open access. And taking a closer look, it is essentially organized around the action plan, essentially organized around three pillars, namely promoting open access amongst researchers, providing concrete support, be it financial, legal, or organizational, for making research resu results openly accessible and for assessing the future success in implementing this action plan. These three pillars form the basis of the action plan, which suggests a number of high-level opportunities to foster open access, uh, through which I will not go in any detail right now. Working out the concrete details for the implementation of this action plan, however, must remain a task for the individual organizations that look into the suggested activities. It is up to them to look more closely at those activities that are of special importance and relevance, depending, of course, on the organization's already acquired expertise in dealing with open access. Moreover, implementation requires engaging a number of stakeholders, not only universities and university organizations, but also the library and repository community, scholarly and learned societies, publishers, and so forth, stakeholders all of which have important roles for shaping the future of the research communication system as a whole. And in this regard, to my opinion, it is important to realize that the action plan needs to be seen as a reference document that provides the basis for further discussion, which is heavily needed, and that the endorsement of the action plan on this GRC's annual conference only started a process that is likely to take some time and that, we'll, that we will uh, have to continue on the next year's annual meeting in Beijing. And with that, I pass over to you, Glorious, for the research integrity question, please. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's clear that science is at the heart of uh, the strategies of all nations around the world. Perhaps until not so many years ago, science was more a game of a few players, but nowadays it's globalized and all nations have science at the heart of their strategies. And, uh, and therefore, Having a, an institution, a forum like the GRC, is, is an extremely important element in this scenario where we can, at the same time, improve standards, international standards of the practices of science and, and science funding particularly, but also to foster the development of uh, uh, good initiatives in countries which are developing or emerging in many ways. And of course, uh, 
the number of the increasing number of collaborations and, and joint activities between scientists and institutions around the world requires common standards. So that was <clears throat> the underlining point about having a statement of principles for research integrity. Uh, the responsible conduct of research is <clears throat> sorry, at the very heart, the very essence of the scientific enterprise, and it's intrinsic to society's trust in science. So within the framework of the responsible conduct of research, uh, the basic principles of research integrity, namely uh, honesty, responsibility, fairness, and accountability, are enshrined in foundational documents that describe these responsibilities of researchers and institutions and scientific community elsewhere. So there were previous documents on this respect from other institutions, from other research organizations. Many of us have our own policies in this respect. But it was seen as an important action to have a collective document coming out of a forum which, as mentioned by Peter here, uh, gathers together perhaps 80 to 90 percent of the world's funding for science, which is uh, a lot of resources. So to have a collective statement on scientific integrity by itself brings the topic to the central place where it needs to be for uh, a, 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 a advancement of, of the scientific enterprise worldwide. So while researchers and institutions themselves remain ultimately responsible for undertaking research with integrity, uh, we, research funding agencies, have an obligation to ensure that, research, that the research that we support uh, is conducted in accordance with the highest standards possible. So uh, to that end, uh, we recognize a number of principles that uh, condense the responsibilities of research funding agencies in creating an international environment in which research integrity is at the core of all activities. So we've listed seven principles, very concisely described, as principles should be, uh, and they involve leadership. So agencies must lead by example in the responsible management of research programs. Uh, we also have to be involved in the promotion. So the second key word here is promotion. Research funding agencies should encourage institutions to develop and implement policies and systems to promote integrity in all aspects of the research enterprise. Education is perhaps a very important point in this respect. So research funding agencies should promote continual training in research integrity and, and develop initiatives to educate all researchers and students on the importance of research integrity. Of course, we have to have our, our our uh, commitment with uh, transparent processes. So this is the fourth principle, transparent processes. Research funding agencies should, within the scope of their mandate, publish policies and procedures to promote research integrity and to address allegations of research misconduct. So we have to have a transparent process, clear and transparent process for that. Fifth principle is uh, to respond to allegations of misconduct, right? So during any investigation of misconduct, research funding agencies should support a process that values accountability, timeliness, and fairness in the processes. Uh, we should clearly adopt conditions for research support, so this is the sixth principle. Research funding agencies should incorporate integrity in research as a condition for
for obtaining and maintaining funding by researchers and institutions. So whenever identified cases of misconduct, we should act and act with the instruments that we have. We fund. So whenever found that we have cases of misconduct, we have to uh, take that into account when deciding for funding or even for maintaining the funding that people, uh, uh, researchers may have from our institutions. And finally, international cooperation as a seventh uh, principle. Research funding agencies will work cooperatively with partners to support and facilitate research integrity worldwide. So this is a concise document uh, that uh, condenses all the particularities and features that each institution here represented amongst the 70 nations in this conference. Uh, uh, many of those institutions have different mandates different legal boundaries, different degrees of development, and so this statement of principles uh, is a, a chart, is a pathway. It brings us a look ahead. Uh, of course, it can be developed in the future into more detailed uh, 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 procedures or, or, or principles or actions, but it was thought that uh, having those foundational principles for this question of research integrity was very important. So with that, I end my statement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much to the two co-hosts for this uh, close and even concisive look on the major topics. Now, Dr. Zurich, uh, would you like, please to follow directly? Sure. Thank you. So I would like to say a few words about uh, how the GRC came into existence, uh, what the motivating factors were, and what happened in the very first meeting of GRC held about a year ago at the National Science Foundation just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, about a couple of years ago, um, we were discussing ways in which we can engage uh, funding agencies from around the world. There have been many forums where heads of science and engineering funding agencies routinely meet, G8 meetings, G20 meetings, and so forth. But many of these meetings had evolved um, historically uh, through groups, um, and over time, um, as, as the research landscape in the world changes, uh, the forums, uh, uh, there is a lag time between the composition of the forums and the forefront of where the scientific enterprise is. I see f uh, four factors um, that essentially led to the, uh, the notion of a GRC. The first point is, uh, in a highly and increasingly globalized world, no single country, no single agency can either create policies, enforce policies, or address issues and challenges uh, that come about. Uh, a large fraction of scientific publications today involve authorship from more than two countries, or two countries or more. Uh, there is a large mobility of people. Um, Co-funding of activities is becoming increasingly common. Plus, there is a significant shift in research funding. So if you look at the world today, one-third of all the research funding is in the U.S., R&D funding. The total funding is about $1.4 trillion U.S. dollars. One-third is in the U.S., little less than one-third is in Europe, and one-third is in Asia. And the Asia part is increasing significantly. So that's the first part. The traditional, The second part is that traditional ways in which uh, countries come together, heads of research funding agencies come together, has shifted enormously. For example, last year, for the very first time in the history of science funding, the Asian top 10 Asian countries invested more uh, in, uh, uh, in, in science than the U.S. did. So these kinds of factors and the fact that there is a sig significant change in demographics 
and the largest fraction of scientists and engineers are going to come from different parts of the world with large populations uh, was the precipitating factor. So the first year's meeting was held at the National Science Foundation last year. There were two agenda items at the meeting. The first was to collectively develop through regional meetings the same process that was held here, the principles of scientific peer review, because peer review is the bread and butter of um, uh, the research enterprise. So we developed 47 nations came together at that meeting last year, and we collectively developed, and we had a press conference like this at the, uh, at the middle of the second day, and we released the principles of scientific peer review. The second action item was for all the participants to endorse uh, the creation of what we now call the Global Research Council. So it was unanimously endorsed, uh, and uh, we officially launched the Global Research Council at the end of the meeting uh, last year. So those were the two main objectives. Moving forward, looking to the next five to ten years, at least the foreseeable future, there are a lot of possibilities that lie on the horizon. So many countries are increasing, increasingly investing in science and engineering. Uh, countries from small countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and Qatar uh, to very large countries and countries in Africa, for example, uh, see science and engineering research and education as a ticket to economic prosperity to lift millions of people out of poverty. So an organization like the Global Research Council can play a unique role in facilitating the creation of a scientific enterprise uh, in ways in which no other body can, can facilitate. The second uh, point I want to make is science and engineering, education and research has no borders. But funding agencies are clearly defined by borders with taxpayer money, local government regulations, local government bureaucracies, so how do you take a, a con highly constrained group of funding agencies and create an enterprise that interacts in the more realistic world where there are no borders with respect to people or knowledge? And that's a challenge. So there is no existing agency or organization for science funding that can address that. And the Global Research Council, if if it does its job properly over the next 10 years, has the opportunity to address that. So that would be sort of a mission looking into the future. In fact, at the next year's meeting in Beijing, uh, some specific action items related to these topics will be discussed in addition to action items to be completed at, uh, at the Beijing meeting. So let me stop at that point. Thank you very much. And now finally, Professor Bai, Dr. Blaine, could you please give us your look ahead to next year's meeting? So I would like to uh, start by uh, my uh, compliments to the DFG and the two chairs for uh, organizing such a wonderful and product meeting. Uh, we have all enjoyed very much. So the next meeting will be uh, taking place in Beijing at the end of May uh, next year. Uh, <coughs> we do this uh, with uh, our partner, uh, NSERC, and the NSFC, the National Science Foundation of China, to make a Beijing meeting uh, just as a successful and productive. So the, the meeting will be uh, starting with the GRC board meeting on May 26th afternoon, and the council meeting from May 27th and the 28th. So uh, the, we will have uh, two topics at the 2014 GRC meeting. Uh, one will be uh, on the open access, a continuation of this year's uh, discussion. Based on what we have achieved at this meeting, and the further communication and discussions in the months ahead, I believe we will be uh, able to achieve much more at the next meeting. The second topic uh, is will be uh, shaping the future of science, training the next generation of sci uh, scientists. Given the challenges we have uh, in advancing science, I would say uh, this is an equally important topic that our funding agencies and the other performing institutions 
need to uh, take a lot of attention to. So this topic is so close related to the GRC mission, uh, as uh, Subra just mentioned it. So I would say uh, such as related to scientific uh, integrity, uh, science quality, mobility, education, and international cooperation. So our co-host, uh, NSERC and uh, NSFC, all believe this is an important topic and have uh, provided a lot of inputs in shaping up the topic. So I want to leave uh, this to my uh, whole co-host, Isabella, uh, to further elaborate. Okay. Um, with respect... Thank you. Um, with respect to open access, uh, we have the beginning of a plan, uh, but we don't really have a global action plan. Um, so next year will be another step towards uh, this uh, global action plan, and, and uh, the focus will be on monitoring progress that uh, we will collectively make uh, you know, between this year and, and next, but also start developing performance indicators. How will we recognize success? How will we know that you know, we're there as opposed to not quite there yet? So I think there's uh, important elements of that uh, framework to be um, developed uh, on, on uh, performance uh, indicators. Um, with respect to the other topic, the shaping the future of science, the training of the next generation, um, I, I think we're all um, dealing with challenges. Uh, how do we better prepare our next generation of scientists and, and engineers? And, and uh, probably focusing on you know, PhD years, postdoctoral years, and, and the first, uh, you know, first you know, four or five years of uh, their research careers. Uh, how do we make sure that they're prepared for their, their careers? What type of skills and what type of knowledge in addition to uh, a very good training in their scientific area do they need? I know professional skills. Uh, we've talked about research integrity. So are, are they, those principles, integrated in, in the development of our uh, next generation of, of scientists? How um, can we use... Um, encouragement of mobility and enabling mobility as a way to broaden the skill set and the experience that our young scientists uh, develop in, in their formative uh, years. Um, what are some of the best practices at the uh, meet, at, at, you know, when we introduce those topics, the uh, participants around the table really focus on best practices, identifying various contexts that are relevant to uh, different parts of the world and different levels of, of uh, research uh, development, but also what are best practices so, so that we don't all recreate the same wheel. So learning from one another in terms of uh, paying attention to um, uh, the training. What are some of the barriers to all of any of those topics? And because without identifying the barriers, we're not going to be able to address them. Um, finally, um, how can the funding agencies work better to meet that uh, global uh, objective and that global challenge? Um, so in, in terms of the process to get there, um, we will again this year um, have a number of, of regional meetings. Um, in, in Africa, in uh, Asia, Pacific, in Europe, uh, in uh, the Middle East and North Africa and, and America that will bring the uh, input and, and you know, a first discussion at the, at the regional level and then we will bring those issues um, at the uh, May 27-28 uh, meeting in Beijing where there will be more in-depth discussion and, and uh, uh, possibly establishing some common principles on um, the, the, the development of, of the next uh, generation, but also uh, exchange of practices and, and just sharing our uh, respective uh, knowledge and experience on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all these the, uh, different statements. Now we have some 20 minutes for your questions, and uh, if you could Please give us your name and the media or institution you're with and uh, to whom your question is addressed to. Starting with... 
Ladies first, of, of, of course, ladies first, starting with. Okay. Okay, starting with. Manfred. Hallo, ja, bin ich? Ist es an? Ja, okay. Manfred Ronsheimer, a freelance based, a journalist based in Berlin. Uh, a question to Mr. Suresh. Can you repeat the, the, the figure uh, uh, of uh, how many money is spent uh, in Asia for research and development? And why uh, is, um, isn't uh, UNESCO the basis for these uh, aggregation uh, of scientific dis discussions you, you started? So, first on the, your first question, um, you can find actually all the numbers and figures in two reports. One is the National Science Board indicators uh, from the National Science Foundation in the U.S. They release an annual report on funding metrics. The other is the Bettel Memorial report, which came out this year, early this year. So, according to that, when you are just for purchasing power parity, The total R&D investment in the world is 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars. It's 1,400 billion U.S. dollars, and of which it's roughly one-third, one-third, one-third. Um, the information that I quoted uh, about uh, well, Asia is, um, uh, you can find that in the Betel report, you can also find in the National Science Board report. Uh, it's approximately one-third. Uh, investment in R&D in Asia now, uh, on par or slightly above Europe now. So, um, that, w sorry, what was your second question? Uh, the, the GRC. Yeah. Uh, why isn't it uh, uh, an activity of the United Nations? Because you want science to be handled by scientists and not by politicians or lawyers or accountants. Global Research Council are um, research funding agencies which distribute uh, public money, but uh, which do so on a semi-autonomous basis, so to say. They are independent from ministerial or political or co concrete and direct political impact on the funding decisions um, they make. And um, that wouldn't be the case with the UNESCO, of course. Thank you. Another question? Yes, Kasia Hartmann from the Humboldt Foundation. I have a question just to understand the process of this all. You said you passed an action plan. Uh, how do I have to envision this? Which means, did you vote on it? Did, did, so every, everybody in the room voted on it? And did really everybody vote on it? And are there any, um, I mean, is it binding? Well, what happens if... if Nobody takes action on this action plan, which we won't ha uh, hope. And the second uh, question I have, have probably goes to, to Mr. Uh, Professor Blaine. Uh, who comes together at these regional meetings? Is it just the members who are represented here, or is the circle of people who come together at the regional meeting larger than that? Um. We agreed, we entirely agreed on the um, action plan towards open access. We, we, we didn't see the necessity um, of um, doing a formal voting because it was a broad consensus over the entire membership of the GRC. Um, it is binding not in a legal way but in a normative way, so to say. Um, uh, and it cannot be binding in a legal way because... Um, um, the different member um, councils of the GRC or the, the different member organizations um, have very different um, forms of legal constitution and of legal power. For example, to take the DFG as an example, um, which is an eingetragener Verein, according to, to German uh, legislation, is not able uh, to, fo to, to formulate formally binding um, uh, prerequisites uh, according with um, open access um, policies um, uh, from the um, applicants of, of DFG funds, of course. If I could just uh, add a point to that. GRC is not a legal entity. It's a volunteer organization. 
the 70 heads of funding agencies have come here voluntarily on, with their own money. DFG did not pay them to, to, to come. And that's the spirit of it. And, and the idea is that if we have these principles in place that are collectively developed, it sends a very powerful statement that the leading for the people who fund 80 to 90 percent of all science in the world think these are the things that are important for science. So if there are bilateral collaborations or multilateral collaborations among a subset of this group, then they are essentially, th there is peer pressure on them to abide by them. That's how it's intended to work. And uh, with respect to uh, who attends the regional meetings, we send uh, very broadly invitations to obviously all of the funding agencies of, in our respective regions. We encourage participation of all of the funding agencies, um, but we can also invite other stakeholders who would have something to say to the various topics. Uh, for instance, I'm aware that last year in Europe, um, with respect to uh, open access, universities uh, were invited as well as some publishers were invited. So I, I think we want to have uh, good input in uh, preparing the, the various statements so you go and get the input that's needed to inform the, uh, the, the thought process leading to uh, either an action plan or, or uh, a statement of, uh, of principles. Perhaps I may add a little comment on that as well because, uh, of course, the spectrum of funding agencies is very large in many countries. You have many different funding agencies and, uh, and it would be extremely difficult to gather everybody from all the nations involved into the annual meeting. So. On the other hand, in the regional meetings, yes, we can have a much broader participation. Uh, I can give the example of Brazil, where we have some national funding agencies, my own, CNPq, but others. But we have a very fertile system of state funding agencies in, the, in Brazil, which uh, are also very much involved into funding research. And then those ones can participate at the regional meetings. We may have another question before coming from, to questions from outside. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Lauren Schröter, German Radio. Um, on what did you not agree? So you said on what you agree and what were the topics you don't agree. You didn't. I don't think there was disagreement in any aspect. There is obviously different stages or different mandates of different agencies. There are things that different ages can do and other agents cannot do. So uh, uh, if there were discussions, they were more on what would be a consensus document that could cover for all the possibilities. As an example, uh, there are some agencies that would rather suggest for institutions and researchers because they can do that. Others would uh, recommend. Others may require a binding to some things. Others may stimulate. Others may actually do the, the investigations, the institutions themselves. So there are a, a, a spectrum of, of different activities. So what could we write about it? What could be established as a principle that could be uh, essential for all of us? So that was most the, at the heart of the discussions. There was much disagreement for example, in the open access topic, possibly uh, Peter can, can comment on that, but even on that subject, which is much more controversial in terms of the economics behind it for different countries, uh, there wasn't much uh, disagreement about the importance of open access. Perhaps there was different trends and velocities where different nations or agencies are actually doing things. Uh, 
Um, and I think that's the beauty of having the regional meetings, where you get into the diversity and, and you get, you know, you, you identify those differences of, of context and legal requirements and, and, and therefore coming to uh, the annual meeting here, um, consensus has already been achieved, you know, through the regional meetings and through the international steering committee that takes the input from the five regions. So there's a, a quite a, an extensive process of consensus, consensus building throughout the, uh, the process. Point, but differentiation of positions is a yeah. point. And, and the open access um, thing is a good example. Uh, and the regional conferences on the open access um, um, uh, issue are a good example. If, um, if it uh, were the case that, um, say, uh, CNPQ, um, that our organizations uh, uh, were to develop a, a policy paper on open access, um, it, would, uh, it would read quite differently. And uh, some of these differences um, um, come from the fact that uh, in parts of the world, even the access to Internet um, is not a simple thing. Uh, it, it's not even technically um, a simple thing. So you come to very different perspectives on the value of the, the, value of the open access um, 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 paper we um, endorsed, um, the value is um, on finding a level of principle or normatively uh, uh, consensical um, formulations which all around the world um, could adopt and one of them will go a, on a higher velocity, uh, on a different pace um, that way. Uh, the important thing is um, the same direction, not only the same way, but only also the same direction on that way, because you can go on a way in different directions, certainly. Okay, I think we'll... Last question from inside, Barbara Gilman. Yes, please. Barbara Gilman, I'm going to Sorry, we need, to, we need the microphone for the live streaming. Okay, thanks. But one question to the misconduct. Is, which is the worst misconduct you see worldwide that you want to avoid or to fight? Um, is there a big difference in the level of misconduct in the different areas of the world, in Asia, in Europe, and in, in the U.S.? And, and is it materially a, a big difference? And give us uh, some examples of misconduct you want to fight, mainly. Yeah, I think that there are many cases that hit the the press, and I think the one on on cloning, human cloning, was was one example of that. Uh, but uh, the multiplication of the scientific activity uh, effectively requires. Uh, that we have very strict procedures to evaluate. Science is a ever-constructing process. It's, in a way, self-correcting. Uh, it's at the very heart of the scientific method to repeat procedures, to check and balance whatever has been done by someone else. And uh, But... So it, it's, it's at the heart of the scientific procedure to identify uh, errors. But what we have to take very much care is about uh, uh, cases where are not just errors but actually misconduct. We are talking about uh, plagiarism, so people just copying someone else's work without properly quoting them, fabrication of data, falsification of data. These are just a few examples of, of, of scientific misconduct. Authorship of, of scientific work with proper credits of the ones that have actually done the work. Uh, uh, so these are all examples of uh, uh, 
misconduct that have to be investigated and, and clearly uh, uh, corrected and punished in the cases where we can identify them. Yeah, just to add, uh, to add one sentence on Paul Gilman. Um, misconduct is not only about intentionally breaking rules of good science, um, but misconduct is also about uh, being not rigid enough in pursuing experiments, being not rigid enough in um, interpret um, um, experimental outcomes, being loosely in, um, in uh, yeah, Mir fehlt das Wort für Schluderei. Ja? Das fehlt mir. Also auf Englisch meine ich, im Deutschen kann ich das. Ja? Um, that, is, um, that is as an important aspect of scientific or scholarly or um, uh, misconduct as the intentionally uh, uh, breaking of, of rules. Um, every scientist uh, around the world has, um, um, has to be trustful in. Okay. Well, uh, there are regions around the globe which are developing their national systems of science and technology. And, uh, and, uh, and so they are in the process of implementing procedures for actually uh, uh, investigating the cases of misconduct and, and, and finding the right instruments for, for uh, 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 enforcing good practices in science. Uh, it's important to say that, uh, of course, science is, is effectively a human being endeavor, and uh, and people's jobs and uh, and careers many times are affected by the measures of what they are doing, as it is in any any other area of human activities. So uh, there are people that may be tempted or, or there are uh, induced or whatever you want to say to, to do that. And, and we as funding agencies have to uh, give a clear signal to our PhD students, to our researchers, to our uh, uh, scientists that uh, science is at the heart of our and trust in science is at the heart of our activities. Society is paying for this uh, tremendous endeavor. I mean, we are talking about 1.4 trillion. This is more than the whole of Brazil's GDP. So uh, uh, it's a lot of money, with, and, and mostly public money, which is, in, is being invested into, the, into science. And so we, we, and people want to trust what the scientists are doing with, with those funds. And, uh, and, and we agencies have to abide to that. Okay, thank you. Only, only five minutes left. We have to look at uh, questions from outside, and I take over to my colleague Cornelia Loloso, who has a look on it. I have one question concerning open access again. Richard von Norden Nature asks if the statement says that what works for country A may not be suitable for country B does suggest that the details of open access policies will be worked out on an individual rather than a collective basis. And looking at the preferences and positions of all the countries that participated in the GSC's global annual meeting, do the majority support the gold route or the green route? The first answer is yes, and the second answer is none of both. <laughs> <laughs> I hope these answers are clear enough. Rich, Richard, I don't know. <laughs> okay, Cornelia, another question from outside? Yeah. Uh, no? No. Then, then we'll have last question from inside. Um, my name is Venkis from uh, Redaktion und Recherche. Um, do you agree... Um, on a special point, how far open access of um, scientific work should go internationally? No, this was not into a debate. Um, um, the, there's a common sharing of principles on how to um, facilitate 
access to scientific publications as well as scientific data, of course, but our focus was in scientific publications in scientific journals, which is the core, um, the core of the problem. Um, that was um, to which the, we focused um, in the discussion. And um, how, to, how, to, how should I imagine um, to which extent? The, the problem of or what the debate is about is not to what extent, but um, uh, by what um, um, economic uh, impact, by what business models, by what uh, publication forms, by what standards of um, uh, quali quality um, um, uh, assurance of quality in uh, open access publications, and who pays for it. That is um, the central the central issue um, uh, the action plan is about. Very good. Of course, uh, there was absolutely no disagreement on the fact that research information coming out of public funding should be openly accessible for the public who has funded that research. There's a, an agreement in the respect. The whole question is how to implement that <clears throat> in a way where we are sustainable in all aspects, economic, but also in terms of quality. So uh, peer-reviewed journals, they, they are at the, s at the core of the uh, quality control of the scientific results, where we evaluate peers, evaluate what is being said in a given publication, and, and, and that gives us the quality assurance which is necessary for the whole process of growth of knowledge in the scientific arena. Uh, and that, that comes with a cost, of course. And then uh, the whole question is how we can uh, abide to the two principles. We have to have the quality assurance, and we have to provide the information openly for those who have effectively paid for it. So this is a process which has to be built up collectively. No one nation can take one decision in an isolated form. For example, if Brazil decides to the now pay for all Brazilian researchers in an open access. Then all the Brazilian papers will be seen by everybody else, but we wouldn't be able to see everybody else's papers if they also are not in an open access process. So uh, 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 this equation has to be collectively uh, uh, found uh, the solution for it. So this is the real question. There's no discussion about the importance of opening uh, the access for publications. And further down the road in this actual plan towards open access, we will certainly discuss the open access to data, which is even more challenging. Uh, we estimate that perhaps around 20% of what we fund gets effectively published. For example, we don't have journals for negative results. We don't publish negative results. And many times we are refunding research into a negative result area. Uh, it's very typical in my agency. Uh, in, in Brazil we have a lot of e effort in trying to find, uh, using our biodiversity to try and test against some infectious diseases. And uh, in every round of proposals in my agency, you find thousands of people trying to test all kinds of different plants from the Brazilian biodiversity against Chagas disease or schistosomiasis or malaria. And people only publish the ones that are effectively showing some sort of activity, not the other ones. And, and then other people are just trying to test them again and again and again. So uh, can we open the data? Can we uh, uh, then social sciences, databases from social sciences should be opened? So uh, possibly in the near future, and we'll find ways where we can uh, share more information, not just 
through publications, but also through databases. And we have terrifying figures on the non-reproducibility of experiments, of, pu of published experiments That's right. um, in sciences and engineering. This is a very complex uh, field. Um, we have to tackle with and um, publication to uh, open access to data is one of the um, is one of the major issues um, in this field. In my own area of research, which is structural biology, many years ago, I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, there was a collective decision that you should not be able to publish a crystal structure if you don't deposit all the diffraction data. So Nature Science and any other big journals, they, or, uh, they require the raw diffraction data to be deposited into a proper database, international database, uh, before the actual publication gets accepted. So uh, it's a procedure that may be uh, developed for, for many other areas as well. Okay, thank you. As a very last, there is a following question also to open access from outside because uh, Professor Strohschneider, your former answer in fact was uh, considered to be too short. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually the first time that I'm sad so. Uh, I've never been, <laughs> been acclaimed of short answer. Uh, only, quite the contrary. Martin Ensering from Science asked if you could elaborate on the green versus gold answer. No, we, we, no, we, we, actually, we, we, we actually do not uh, prefer one of these both ways, but we say it is depending on the regional situation, it is depending on the mandate of the organization, uh, which of these uh, both ways um, um, uh, the organization wants, uh, wants to support. Um, it is impossible. It, it, it is impossible um, with regard to the global situation um, to prioritize one or the other way right now. And um, um, as speaking for the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft for the German Research Foundation, this is also the policy um, we endorsed over the last years. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation, the two co-hosts, the two coming Thank hosts. Thank you for your interest and your attention uh, in this press conference here, inside and outside. This uh, conference is closed. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.